everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining the Botanical Watercolor for Wellbeing Workshop with Allegheny Mountain Institute as partnered with Augusta Health. We are an educational nonprofit working to cultivate healthy communities through food and education. We strive to meet our mission through a three-pronged approach, which includes an 18-month tuition-free farm and food system fellowship, institutional support for schools and hospitals, and regional networking to build a food system that nourishes our body, our environment, and our economy. I'm Sarah Spinner, I'm a community fellow, and I'll be hosting today's workshop. Um, I'd like to remind you that this workshop is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. So if you'd prefer not to be recorded, feel free to turn off your video. Also closed captions are on and you can choose to opt in or not. If you choose to opt in, you can just click on the closed caption option and um, just click show subtitles. Also, everyone is currently on mute. So if you have any questions, please utilize the chat box. I'll be monitoring it throughout the workshop. And we'll also have a few minutes at the end to dedicate just to answering questions. Um, but now I'm going to pass things over to Sophie. She is my fellow community fellow and wonderful coworker and friend here at the AMI farm at Augusta Health. And she'll be going over some introductory information about botanical art, walking through some exercises and tips. There will be a time after each exercise to practice and a free paint at the end to put it all together. So yeah, I'll pass it off to Sophie. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so first I'm just gonna go over some introductory information uh, about botanical art and illustration. So botanical art and illustration offer more uh, than just the practice of depicting a subject. They provide an opportunity for building closer relationships with plants and fungi, a medium for mindful and meditative art artistic practice and a chance to learn and grow our overlapping skills of scientific observation and creative expression. Um, creating a portrait of a plant can be a wonderful process of mutual asking and receiving of learning and respectfully portraying. Whether or not you ask the subject of your painting questions out loud, I would wager that you will learn something about them during the process of your work today. Um, so quickly, some useful qualifications. Uh, botanical art typically describes artistic depictions of plants and fungi, whose purpose may be uh, to be aesthetic and expressive more than to be scientifically accurate or may balance these factors, but generally it's not created specifically as a scientific illustration. Uh, botanical illustration technically refers to a practice of scientific illustration that emphasizes scientific record and botanical accuracy. So botanical art is generally accurate, scientifically, but is not necessarily a complete record of the plant and more emphasis tends to be placed on the aesthetic value of the piece. Um, so then just going over some historical uh, works of botanical art, talking about the history of botanical art. Uh, botanical art has been practiced by human beings for many thousands of years. The specific genre known as botanical illustration can be traced back to a book called De Materia Medica, an uh, illustrated book created by, in, in Greece between 50 and 70 CE. But this work by no means marks the beginning of human beings depicting and detailing their observations of plants and other more than human kin through the visual arts. Um, scientific and artistic illustrations of plants and fungi are present throughout human history, a fact that is significant because it demonstrates the importance of our varying and complex relationships with plants and fungi as human beings. I want to note that while the, gen the genre of botanical illustration is often associated with European and Western history, uh, this is not at all the complete story of botanical art and illustration. Um, histories of botanical art and the change in popular styles and mediums over time, as well as the development of distinct styles of scientific illustration are complex. Um, and specific to every region, cultural group, and community. There could certainly be a workshop or many workshops just about the history of botanical art as it intersects with geography, culture, and community throughout the history of the world. And I'm certainly not an expert on this topic, so I'll leave it here for now. But if you wanna learn more about botanical art and how it may be woven into the history of your culture, region, or community, I certainly suggest looking into it as I think it can be a really interesting angle from which to learn about our own ancestors and their relationships with the plants and fungi that they interacted with, as well as about their particular forms of artistry and creative expression. Um, it can also just be very inspiring to find works of botanical art from historic and modern artists to appreciate and learn from in our own practices of botanic art. So some of the health benefits 
of art and creativity and practicing botanical arts. Um, I've always found it rewarding to be able to slip into a state of meditative focus while creative, creating art. And this definitely doesn't mean that you won't have moments of frustration or that there won't be times when you find every brushstroke difficult and unwieldy. These things will definitely happen. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to stop and breathe and keep myself from trashing whatever it is I was working on because it just wouldn't fit itself to look like the picture in my head. Um, and I definitely don't expect this practice to feel immediately easy and calming. Um, so I hope that you can go into the workshop today thinking about that. Um, in fact, it may be very difficult at first and continue to challenge you. But instead of beating yourself up for your mistakes, I've found it helpful to learn the ability to face these challenges uh, with the knowledge that every piece of art you create is such a valuable lesson. Um, and sometimes the pieces that feel like a mess of mistakes even more so than those that feel like successes. So every effort you make genuinely does help you grow as an artist. Uh, you can also integrate calming breathing practices into this process as well, if that's helpful for you. And I always find it really beneficial as well to create a calming environment for myself to the extent that I can when I create art. Um, you can put on calming music or a podcast you like, light candles, wear something comfortable and set up an aesthetically pleasing art space for yourself um, with enough light to work with and all of your supplies laid out in a way that makes sense for you. If you're more casual or like to be a bit messy and impromptu, that's good too. Here at EMI, we view food as, food as medicine and this practice is a wonderful opportunity to draw benefit from that medicine um, from another angle than just eating through the act of interacting with and studying plants through your art. So uh, thank you all so much for being here again. I know Sarah said that at the beginning of the um, workshop, but I'm glad that you're all here. We're gonna go into some exercises now. And we've got videos to explain each exercise that we pre-recorded. Um, so the exercises that we're gonna do today, and there'll be a little bit of time, um, three to four minutes after each exercise in which we'll just play some calming music and you can do the exercise yourself if you brought um, if you brought supplies today. So the exercises we're gonna do are basically just introductory watercolor exercises that could be applied to any kind of watercolor. Uh, but I definitely had to learn all these things when I was first getting started with botanical art. Um, so the first exercise will be creating an even wash and a graded wash. The second will be go bold wet wood and wet painting that's what we called it but anyways um i'll explain it more in the video uh working in layers wet and dry painting and then just learning how to use a tissue to remove mistakes and soften edges which is really important in watercolor and learning how to create white lines which is particularly useful for botanical watercolor and i'll explain why in the video um but just a few things before we get into those exercises uh, something that my art teachers have always emphasized with me is the importance of brush care when it comes to watercolors. So if you have brushes in front of you right now, and if you've never used uh, watercolor brushes before, uh, just know that it's really important after you, you are done using a brush to wash it off and stand it up. You never want to leave it sitting in water. Uh, if you're about to use it again, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take it out, wash it off, and then like lay it down on my paper towel or something like that, but just don't leave it sitting in water because it degrades the brushes. Um, so another thing is if you're looking at supplies to buy and whatever paper and supplies you brought with, your, with you today is fine. Um, but when I'm looking for watercolor paper, I try to look for something really heavy because uh, really thin papers tend to warp with watercolors. So uh, I look for something that's about 140 pounds. That's what it says on the on the paper when you buy it. Um, and yeah, I think after that, we can just go into the exercises. First thing that we're gonna learn how to do is uh, even wash and a gradient wash or a graded wash. Um, and these are just sort of important foundational techniques for watercolor that then once you know how to do it, you can transfer it into your painting. Um, so for an even wash, what you're going to do is you want to mix up your color or just take it from your, your palette um, and add some water to it. So you can see here I have some of this purple color, purplish magenta-ish, and um, you want to have 
for your setup, uh, two jars of water, one, ideally two jars of water, it's fine if you don't, um, but one of them you can use for washing your brush and one of them you can use for drawing clean water from. Um, so I've got that set up and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, draw like a, a, a rectangle on your paper and then you want to just fill your brush with as much color and pigment as you can. And you want to use the largest brush that you have for this because uh, it's easier to get an even wash that way. And then you start by just filling in. I don't know if I got enough pigment on that one. But you fill in pigment at the top of your paper and you should be working on to dry paper for this. And then you're just going to pull pull that pigment down the paper as you go. So you follow where you see like a bead of pigment at the edge of the paper or at the edge of uh, where you're working and you just pull that bead, continue to pull it down all the way down the page. If you need to draw some down, you can do that. But this, by doing this, you're spreading the pigment so that it should distribute evenly across an area. And that's the basic idea with this, is just learning how to evenly distribute pigment across a predetermined area. And as you can see, I'm not amazing at this, <laughs> but there we go. So that's, that's a basic even wash right there. And it's not completely even. You can see that there's areas that are slightly darker and areas that are slightly lighter, but that's sort of the basic idea of it. Graded wash or a gradient wash. And um, these are a little bit trickier. As you can see, I've already kind of messed it up here, but I'm gonna try again. Um, and it's okay if this doesn't work out for you on your first time. But the basic idea is that we're creating a uh, more ombre version of the even wash. So it's gonna start dark and then get lighter as we move down on the paper. So you start in a similar way. You just lay in color and pigment onto the top of your area and then you're going to start pulling it down similarly to with the even wash but then you wash your brush a little bit and you want to still have a little teeny bit of pigment on there but now it's going to be more clean water you don't want it to be so much water that it sends the pigment running back up like i kind of just did um, but you just want to the idea is that you're working in more clean water here and you can keep washing your brush and start drawing a little bit of clean water. You want to control the amount of water that you're using here if possible and also working on a flat surface is good so like you can see here I've got a little bit of pooling of pigment going on in the corner there and that's because my surface is not completely flat. But this is the basic idea. You're just drawing, drawing the pigment down in a similar way to with the even wash, but by the end, you should be just using clean water and it should create sort of a ombre <laughs> effect. <laughs> All right. So it's the even wash and a graded wash. So if you wanna go ahead and try those things now is the time. Is wet and wet painting. Uh, and this is like a little bit freer and I want to challenge you to um, be really bold with your pigments in this exercise. Um, so yeah, we can watch the video and then you'll have another few minutes to try this out. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to learn how to work wet on wet. Um, and for this exercise, I want to challenge you to use, uh, to go as bold as you can and use as dark of a pigment as you can because this is a big issue that a lot of people have when they're starting out with watercolor is that they uh, tend to go really light um, because it's such a light medium um, that can be an issue you don't get as bold colors um, and it can be good to start out light because you can do a lot of different layers in a watercolor painting but 
it's also good to know how to go bold. So I'm gonna use a bold color here. I'm gonna go for this orangey yellow red color and I'm just gonna draw a bunch of it into my palette. Okay, so once you've got a bunch of paint mixed up in your palette, then for this technique what you're gonna do is basically you take, so you want your brush to be clean, you take clean water and you're just gonna lay that clean water in and cover as much surface as you want to be uh, filled in with color. So definitely don't put the water into any areas that you want to stay lighter or uh, that you don't want to paint yet. So just fill in the shape right here. I'm doing sort of like a ovular circle shape. <laughs> and then once you've got that wet surface, you can sort of see the wetness there. You can start laying in color. Just be really bold with it and see what happens. And as you'll see, the, the paint will start to expand to fill that space. And it may not fill the whole space, but it's definitely not going to stay out of any areas that are wet, so you want to be aware of that while you're doing this. And then when that dries a little bit, you can lay in other colors as well. If you want, you can make effects or you can move the pigment around. So I like to sort of once I have that pigment in there, I like to use that. So if I'm trying to fill in one area of my painting, I'll move the pigment that I've dropped in around to sort of create the effects that I want to create. But you can also leave it just looking sort of interesting and weird. That's fun too. You can drop in other colors create something strange and fun. And this is also if you're trying to shade in an area, you can drop in a darker color to one, one part and it, it may expand slightly into the other side or into your other parts, but it shouldn't go too far. Like you see how I've got mostly red on this side and now mostly purple on this one. So that's how to work wet on wet. We are going to let you try that exercise now. <laughs> um, so we'll give you a few minutes to try that out and then we'll come back. Now we're going to move on to the next exercise, um, which is this working in layers, wet and dry painting. So you can see we're sort of building um, as we go from learning how to work in wet to work in dry. Technically create, creating a wash is also working wet in wet. Um, but these are all good foundational skills to learn if you're trying to get into watercolors. Yep. So we'll watch the video and then um, you'll have some more time to try this out. Okay, so the next exercise we're going to do is learning how to do wet and dry painting. So we kind of did that uh, technically with the, the gradient, but it's an important thing to learn how to do if you're doing uh, layers in a painting. So let's take one of your sections that looks like it's pretty dry. So if your even wash is pretty dry or your graded wash, um, then we can take another color. So now this is pretty dry. I'm just going to take some water, take another color. Let's say that you want it to go in and darken an area. Sometimes the best way to do that is by laying in color. onto dry paper because then it won't spread past where you want it to go. So let's say I just want it to go just right in this area. I'm going to do my best to soften the edges because what's going to happen here is that you may have some harder edges because you're putting wetness onto dryness. But the nice thing is, honestly, as scary as watercolor can be, <laughs> Uh, after you've put the pigment down on the paper, you can move it around. Even after it has dried, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't still move things around. So like if it dries and there's a hard line uh, that you don't want, like the pigment has collected in a certain area, then you can just go in with a wet brush 
and move that around. So try putting some, some bold or darker color on top of what you've already got in your dried, in one of your dried exercises and see if you can move that around uh, without adding in water first. So just painting wet onto dry. I hope that it goes well for you and we'll, we'll come back uh, in just a few minutes. But yeah, this is learning how to remove mistakes, soften edges, both super important things for watercolor because a lot of what you're gonna be doing is really just like learning how to move uh, pigment around and control it on your paper. Um, yeah, so let's watch the video and then we can go into a few minutes to practice it. So the next exercise we're going to do is uh, learning how to use a little bit of paper or paper towel to fix some mistakes that you've made. So if you've got a painting that's still a little wet, like this one's a little wet, <laughs> Uh, and there's an area that you want to change or fix, or if there's uh, pigment lines that you want to try to get rid of and uh, it's still like a little bit wet, what you can do is just go in with a piece of paper towel and lift some of that pigment out. You can also do this, you can create effects using this, like if you want one area to have some like little light spots, um, something you can do is just put down a little bit of that color and lay it in and then go into the areas that you want to be lighter with a paper towel and just lift the pigment out like that. So if you want to try that on your paper, uh, just put some, some watercolor down and then use a little piece of paper towel and try lifting areas and you can try smudging as well, uh, smudging little bits so you don't have to lift as heavily. This is cool if you're trying to create some kind of an effect, like this almost looks like clouds in a sky or something like that. Um, so it's useful for that, but it can also be useful if you want to take out some harder edges. Um, you can go back in, you can even re-wet an area like that. And then go in and take your paper towel and dry it. So I'm not entirely happy with how this came out, so I'm gonna go in and try to change it a little bit. And you can do this too, if there's any parts of your previous exercises that you wanna try to clean up do that great um i hope that went well i just want to address a question that we had in the chat because i think it'll be easier to um just talk than type it all out but i think so we didn't go over palette setup at the beginning um but so if you have a if you have like a, a palette of watercolors all the colors uh laid out there and then um usually what i'll do is i'll have like a separate surface for mixing colors in so um you can take a brush and put some water on it and get some color from uh, like the pigment from the tray and then put the pigment onto a separate surface and mix it with a little bit of water um, as much as you want to dilute the pigment. Uh, that's usually how, how I'll work. You can also work directly from the tray. If you don't want to mix your colors, you can just put a little bit of water on the brush and then uh, use that brush to pull pigment directly from the tray of, of paints that you have. Um, and every palette is a little bit different, so they're they're all going to be set up a little differently. Um, but if you're if you're still confused about um, how to draw colors from your paints, uh, then maybe maybe asking a more specific question, I can I can get more into that as well. Um, but I hope that that I hope that that's a little clearer. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't go over that at, at the beginning. Um, I know it can be a little confusing with different palettes and the way that they're set up. Uh, so I think we have one more exercise and we can go into that now and see the video for that. And then we'll have a few minutes to go over that. The thing we're gonna try is uh, exercise. This is just like a cool thing that you can use, um, especially if you're painting leaves or anything that has like veins on it I think it, it especially works well for um, but basically what you want to do is just 
create a shape. So like here, I sort of did the basic outline of like a leaf, um, like a cartoon leaf. So I'm gonna do that again here. And then you wanna let it dry a little bit. Um, so not totally, but just so that it's not sort of sopping wet still. I'm gonna pull some of the pigment out of here so it dries faster. Um, so let it dry just a little bit. And then you wanna take a smaller, probably a uh, clean brush and you wanna wet it just slightly so that it's not totally dry, um, but not totally saturated with water. And then once you think it's like fairly dry, but not totally dry, you can just go in with that brush and create some little white lines. So I like to do this to create veins in a leaf sometimes. It creates kind of a cool effect. So you can see this is working slightly better in certain parts than in other parts and it might just need to dry a little bit before I can really go in and do this effectively. But I've got this main vein right here. And I'm gonna make sure that this brush is not saturated with color and then go back in. Just create these little veins. Yeah, now we're just gonna have a few minutes to try that out and then we'll come back. All right, um, okay, so I think that that was our last small exercise. Um, so now we're just, I'm gonna go over a few uh, tips before we go into our free paint section um, where we will have a photo available of a, a flower from our farm if you want to paint that. Also, if you have a piece of produce or a house plant, uh, handy, you can definitely paint that. I always find it's better to paint a subject that you have right in front of you, but painting from a picture works as well. Um, so in terms of planning your painting, uh, I always think it's really great to be able to draw inspiration from other artists' work. I will sometimes uh, spend a bunch of time before I get started with the painting, just looking online or um, looking through art books, trying to get inspired. Uh, I also think it's really good with watercolors to premix your colors as much as possible because um, a lot of the time you're working uh, in a fast drying um, situation. So if it, the quicker that you can draw color from your palette, the better. Uh, and then creating thumbnail paintings and under drawings also can be really great. We actually have a couple of videos of this to go through before we're gonna get to the free paint section. Um, planning areas of light and shadow, uh, working in layers, and then also just going back over brush care, never leave your brushes in water. So uh, now we'll go into those videos and then get into the free paint section. Think about uh, before starting your painting is that you can premix your colors. It's a little hard to do with watercolor sometimes I find, but it is also nice because then you can move more quickly when you're painting and you don't have to worry about your paint drying up while you're mixing your next color. So for this pair, I'm just gonna mix together some colors that I think would work. Um, and I'm really not an expert in color mixing. There are people who have great tutorials on this online. Um, so if you wanna learn more about color mixing, uh, there's a whole theory and school of thought, different schools of thought. Um, that you can look into. But right now what I'm doing is just really just pulling colors that I think would be interesting here. And I like to try to mix in some more avant-garde colors. I don't always need it to look exactly true to life. So I pull where I think I see some interesting colors here and I'm gonna try to incorporate those in so that I can make a more interesting composition. So I see lots of sort of deep oranges and yellows in this pair. So I'm gonna create some colors and then have those pre-mixed and ready to go. And um, be neater than I'm being here. <laughs> you can definitely, you should probably wash off your palette um, every so often and just have have your colors ready to go. 
All right. So then I'm just gonna do a really quick color study here. You don't have to do this, it's just something that I find can help. These are just colors that I see in this pair, in different tones and shades. Um, and I'm just gonna lay them out on the paper here and see what they look like. And then I'll know which ones I actually wanna use in my final painting. Another important thing to think about when uh, you're going into creating your painting today or whenever you're doing it uh, is that the more prep work you do for it, um, the more planned your painting's gonna look and the more layers you can probably incorporate into it. So something that I've been really excited about recently in my work uh, with watercolor has been working in more layers. And while this might not seem like the best thing to do when you're using watercolors because they are such a free flowing medium, it can actually be really nice to be able to build up layers of color because the color can be really soft and you can also add in various kinds of detail as you go. Um, but something you want to do always uh, when you're starting out a watercolor painting is plan out which areas are going to be lightest and which are going to be darkest. Um, because with watercolor, to uh, create the effective light, you want to leave those areas as white or as light as possible. Um, so if I were creating a painting, I would plan out exactly which areas were going to be the lightest and then work uh, from sort of a lighter wash to a darker wash, uh, leaving those areas blank. Um, so making sure not to put water in the areas that I want to stay white. Another important thing uh, when you're getting ready to start a painting is creating your underdrawing. Um, and the underdrawing is just going to be the sketch that you're working on top of. Um, this is really helpful. You can obviously just put paint on paper without doing a drawing first if you're more comfortable with that. But I always think creating an underdrawing is important uh, with botanical illustration because there can be a lot of sort of little pieces in your painting and it's good to organize all your thoughts on the page before putting down paper or putting down paint, sorry. Um, especially if there's a lot of leaves in your subject or something like that. You just want to make sure that it's centered the way that you want it to be and that uh, you don't get a little ways into your painting and then realize that half of it's going to be off the page or something like that. Um, so when you're creating an underdrawing, it's really important to make it as neat as possible. You don't want it to be sketchy or have a lot of errant marks because once you put the watercolor paint down, you're not going to be able to erase anymore. Um, so some artists will do this by creating a drawing and then using transfer paper to actually transfer a neat version of it to their watercolor paper. Uh, I don't usually do this, I just like to create a, a sketch first and then I'll go from that sketch and sort of try to be really neat when I put down my underdrawing and erase any marks on there that aren't working. Um, so I'll do that right here. I'll create just a sketch of this pair. So this is my sketchy sketch, I guess, where I'm just putting down the shape that I see of it. And one thing that you can do, this isn't so helpful with this subject because it's so simple, but if you're uh, drawing a more complicated or complex subject, something you can do is you can cover one eye to be able to draw just like the silhouette of it. So I'll, I'll try that here as well. This helps a lot if there's like a lot of leaves on your subject. For me, I struggle with perspectives sometimes and being able to, uh, draw something when there's so many different layers of it is really difficult. Um, so it really helps to just do this one eye sketch. I know it might feel weird, but I promise it does actually help because then you're really just drawing the silhouette of whatever you see. You're not superimposing multiple layers of the subject onto your paper at once. So here I've got this sketchy sketch and then I'm gonna work from that and try to create a cleaner underdrawing so I'm, I'm both looking at that sketch and the pair. So I don't wanna be playing telephone with my own work. I want to still make it as true to life as possible. And I don't just wanna be drawing what I think a pair looks like. So that's another important thing when you're doing botanical illustration is to try to draw what you see 
and not what you think you should be seeing um, because plants are wonky sometimes. That's okay, it's cool to capture those things in your work instead of trying to censor them out. Um, okay, so now I've got this sort of cleaner, cleanish underdrawing and I'm going to erase any parts that I don't want to show through. Not that you, you don't want your underdrawing to show through in your final piece, but I'm gonna erase any marks that could be seen. All right, here. And first thing I'm gonna suggest that you do when you're getting prepared for a painting is create some thumbnail paintings or thumbnail sketches um, just to try to get an idea of how you want to center your subject or uh, if you want to put it off to the side, how much you want to zoom in on it, and also what kind of colors you want to use. Um, so for this subject, I'm going to just quickly create a couple of thumbnail, so I'll draw some little thumbnail boxes. I'm going to create some very quick little thumbnail paintings and then choose the one that I like best to turn into a larger painting. Um, so these are just really, really quick, really messy. They don't have to be anything uh, perfect looking or good. You're the only one who's gonna see them. So I'm just gonna take some colors that I think might be good for this pair. Draw some of these up. You want to mix some of your colors beforehand as well. I didn't do that this time. But I'm just going to start out, just do a really quick couple of sketches of what this could look like. So this is one option. I've got the pear sort of on its side like that. And um, the light is happening at the top here. Then another option, I'm gonna try centering it a little bit more in this one. So I'm going to do a little smaller, a little more centered, but the same idea here. But then I can also create some more shadow if I've got it a little more centered. I can do, let's say I want to do a little bit of shadow. So that could be nice. Or maybe I want to go super close up on this pair. This is a pretty simple subject, so it's a little hard to think of ways to change it. Or maybe I'll maybe I'll shift it to be at a different angle and see if I like that better. So Let's try it from this angle. See if it's a little more interesting this way. I'm just going to really quick, you can see, I'm just creating the bare outline of what this could look like and some colors that maybe I'll use. But I can also change up my color palette later. So then I can do shadow. So those are just some quick thumbnail sketches. Okay, uh, great. So I think now we're going to go into the free paint portion of the workshop. Um, and we're running a little bit over time. So if you do have to head out, that's totally okay. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, but for the last, uh, so we're going to do about 12 minutes of free paint if, for those who do want to stick around. Um, and then we're going to have a sharing section and questions 
open. So if you do want to stick around and do some painting, uh, there are some subjects here. This is just a snapdragon that was growing in our greenhouse. Um, but also if you have a subject handy, like I mentioned before, you're welcome to paint that instead. Um, and then we are going to have uh, uh, opportunity for sharing and reflection and then also a Q&A section at the end. So if you can, please stick around, but if not, that's totally fine. And thank you again for coming. Okay, great. Um, so I think we're just gonna come back here. And um, I really wanna thank you so much for participating in these exercises in the free paint period, if you were able to. I hope it was useful and enjoyable time for you. If you're not finished with your painting, that's more than okay. But if you can find a stopping point for now, we're gonna take some time, just a little bit of time here to reflect on the workshop and your experience so far. Uh, we might go kind of quickly through this section so that we can get to Q&A because we are running over time. Um, if you're feeling frustrated with your work or having a hard time pulling yourself out of the mindset of creating, I can completely empathize with that. Uh, but maybe take a minute here just to breathe and center and ground yourself to your breath and come back to the present moment in community. So this is a good time to respond to the reflection questions that are up on the screen or to share any thoughts and feelings that came up while you were painting and to have that space held for you for the rest of us in the workshop. So because of the way that our workshop is formatted, if you can, if anybody has reflections on these questions or on anything else that came up during the workshop, you can type them into the chat and I can read them out for you. Um, and also respond if need be. And then uh, after that, we're just gonna go into a Q&A section. So if anybody does have reflections, um, feel free to put them in the chat now and we can give some a little bit of time for that. Okay, it looks like somebody said um, wet on dry. So I'm not sure if they were which question they were responding to with that. Um, but thank you for sharing. If you want to clarify, feel free, but if not, that's totally okay too. And also uh, thank you to everyone who's been um, putting such kind messages into the chat as they're heading out. I really appreciate it. Oh, the technique you used mostly. Okay, so wet on dry is the, the technique that they use that might've been new to them. So that's great. I'm glad that you got to experience that. Okay, and someone said, um, oop. oh, that was in a, a private message, but they said it was really nice to see my progress as I tried different methods throughout the workshop. So that's great. I'm glad you had that experience. Okay, so there's a question here from Elizabeth. Um, you mentioned different types of color theories. Could you explain what you mean by this? Um, yes, I think I did mention that in one of the videos. I honestly am not an expert on color theory. It's something that I'm learning a lot about right now and have a lot to learn about. Um, but from what I understand, there are, um, I'm not totally sure if different types of color theories is the right way to put it actually, but, um, color theory is really expansive and there's a lot to learn um, about how to mix colors and how to do it for the right, like how to get the, the right um, shades and depths of your color as well. It's like a really, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, so I would recommend looking into color theory more. I honestly don't know a ton about it. Um, okay, Sue asked, are you using solid watercolors? Yeah, so uh, I think this was, I think I was being confusing about this in the chat uh, because I was calling both my tray of watercolors and my mixing palette palettes. Um, but yeah, so my, my tray of watercolors are like solid pigment colors um, that they, you know, came in little packages basically and I just had to unwrap them. They were already in their little cups. Um, so to use those, I'll just take a little bit of water on my brush and then put it onto the, the pigment um, and then mix it on my mixing palette. Um, but everybody's, everybody's set of paints probably looks a little bit different. Uh, you can get watercolors that come in liquid form and tubes, um, 
you can get watercolors that just come in maybe something you would see that looks looks more like a, a set of paints that you would find in like a classroom or something like that where it opens up um, and those are great too they're really great quality paints that look like that as well um, someone said I had difficulty pulling enough pigment onto the palette to mix with other colors tips so I also have difficulty with this I think um, I think the way that I usually deal with it is just by mixing a little bit at a time, honestly. Um, but I do try to like get a little bit of water on my brush and then like, I guess without damaging your brush, scrub it a little bit harder into the palette to just really pick up the pigment, especially if you don't have super pigmented paints. This can be really difficult to do, which means that it's easier to use more heavily pigmented paints usually because it's easier to get more pigment on your brush um, but yeah I would just try like making sure that your paint is wet for one thing when you're like dipping into it and then also like using a little bit less water on your brush and just like really getting a lot of pigment on there before putting that on your mixing palette. Um, Amy said I really like seeing how I can use more or less water to create different looks yeah, that's awesome. I think that that's a lot of watercolor is just like learning how much water you want to use in a different situation or like um, seeing experimenting with that and seeing what works for you. Um, so thank you. Amy. And a uh, question from Catherine, you mentioned the pigment line is that typical of all watercolor? Or is it because the ones used are not high brand? Um, pigment line. So I might have mentioned that uh, like when I think maybe you're referring to like when um, like pigment gathers at the edge of something uh, like when when uh, when it dries and pigment sort of darkens the edges. I, th I think that happens with watercolors of like all different qualities. I'm not totally sure because I haven't used that many different sets of watercolors to be honest. Um, I could be wrong about that. So if it's not happening for you, that's great. If it is happening for you, um, I would, I, I think it happens for everyone to a certain extent. Um, but if I'm misinterpreting your question, feel free to clarify. Um, thank you. I wasn't aware of the solid watercolors. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of really different kinds of watercolors. Um, and I found this like interesting to learn about when I was first getting into them because I've used watercolors that come in more solid pigment, pigment blocks like the ones I'm using now. I also have some that come in tubes. So you have to set up your palette before going ahead and painting. Um, and then there's also, yeah, the, the ones that come more in like little uh, divots, I guess, in like a, a tray of paint. Um, Okay, great. And then uh, we just have a clarification here. Color theory is both the science and art of using color. It explains how humans perceive color and how color can communicate a message. Yes, so that is a much more informative response to that question. Um, yeah, and if you want to check out this image that's been included here as well, I think that could be useful. Okay, great. Um, well, yeah, if anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to post them. But otherwise, thank you so much for attending. Um, yeah, thanks, Sophie. That was amazing. I hope everyone enjoyed that. And again, just like Sophie said, thank you so much for joining us um, and for interacting and everything. Um, so glad to see everyone painting and I know I'm not <laughs> a great painter and I've learned a lot from Sophie just from working and living alongside her. Um, but yeah, if there's any more questions, please email us. I will be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow. And again, this workshop will be posted on Allegheny Mountain Institute's YouTube channel and a link to that will also be sent in the follow-up email. So if there's any topics, feel free to go back and reference them, rewatch the exercises, keep practicing. Also, please check our website for future workshops and events and donations. Our workshops are free and open to the public. Donations and community support make this possible. If you are able, please consider making a donation on our website, amifellows.org, and we hope to see you at future workshops. Thank you guys and have a great rest of your day.